Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. Yes. Okay, perfect. So okay. I'm, I'm, I have a presentation and I'm waiting for approval if I can access, uh, so I can share my presentation. You know, is Pankaj over there? आज के इस कार्यक्रम की औपचारिक शुरुआत करते हैं वे आधारित प्रोफेसर एस एच अस्करी स्मृति व्याख्यान समारोह के अवसर पर आभासी मंच पर उपस्थित आज के कार्यक्रम की अध्यक्षता कर रहे डॉक्टर इम्तियाज अहमद सर पूर्व निदेशक ओरियंटल पब्लिक लाइब्रेरी पटना आज के कार्यक्रम की मुख्य वक्ता डॉक्टर सुनीता शर्मा एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर इतिहास विभाग बी कॉलेज पटना परिचयात्मक संबोधन हेतु आभासी मंच पर उपस्थित प्रोफेसर एस एच चस्करी साहब के नवासा सैयद अहमद राजा साहब बिहार राज्य अभिलेखागार निदेशालय के निदेशक महोदय श्री सुमन कुमार सर बिहार के विभिन्न विश्वविद्यालयों से जुड़े सहायक प्राध्यापक शोध छात्र छात्राओं एवं विद्वत जन बिहार राज्य अभिलेखागार परिवार की ओर से मैं डॉक्टर अशोक रंजन आप सभी का हार्दिक स्वागत करता हूँ अभिनंदन करता हूँ बिहार राज्य अभिलेखागार निदेशालय प्रत्येक वर्ष इतिहास से जुड़े प्रमुख व्यक्तित्वों की स्मृति में स्मृति व्याख्यान समारोह का आयोजन करती रही है इसी कड़ी में आज प्रोफेसर एस एच अस्करी स्मृति व्याख्यान समारोह का आयोजन किया गया है आज के कार्यक्रम का विषय है आइडेंटिफाइंग द फेमिनाइन ट्रेडिशन ऑफ टिमोरिड सिवाइजेशन प्रोफेसर एस एच अस्करी साहब के बारे में हम लोग उनके नवासा सैयद अहमद राजा साहब से सुनेंगे सैयद अहमद राजा साहब की जुबान ही हम लोग प्रोफेसर एस एच अस्करी साहब के बारे में सुनेंगे इसीलिए परिचयात्मक संबोधन हेतु तो उपस्थित आभासी मंच पर प्रोफेसर सैयद अहमद राजा साहब से मैं निवेदन करूंगा राजा साहब आप आभासी मंच पर उपस्थित हैं माइक ऑन कर लें और कृपया कर एस एच अस्करी साहब के बारे में दो शब्द कहें सैयद अहमद राजा साहब थैंक यू सो मच लेट मी रिक्वेस्ट कंट्रोल so i can share my presentation pankaj can you approve the access so i can share my screen I'm waiting for approval, please. Pankaj ji, आप सर की बात आप सुन पा रहे हैं? आपको मेरी आवाज तो आ रही है, लेकिन मुझे वो अगर आप स्क्रीन दे दें एक्सेस तो मैं I can share my presentation. वो रिक्वेस्ट कर रहे हैं स्क्रीन पर एक्सेस देने के लिए तो उसको अगर आप कर सकते हैं तो कर दीजिए Can you see my screen? Uh, Amar, I see a screen before me, but it is blank. Yeah, it shows of showing blank. Also, let me. Uh, can you see it now? No, not yet. Uh, Mankaj, I may need your help here. <laughs> Can you see my screen? 
Um, I mean, we can see on the screen, but the presentation is not there. The slides are not there, I would say. Yeah, I think I have been. Let me try one more thing. Share content. Wait a second. Um, I think now you can see my stream, I believe. Yeah, yeah, it's there. It's there right? Perfect. Congratulations. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. So greetings from Los Angeles. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to deliver this introductory lecture. Uh, it's an honor. I'm not trying to big fit in in some big shoes, but I'm just uh, it's an effort where I will share what we have done so far for the last six years. Um, I had like 60 slides, but uh, I will be very sensitive to the time and I will move quickly. Um, and please stop me if you have any questions, because um, I would like it to be a very interac interactive. But again, um, if it's OK with you, um, I will go to the next slide. Please do. Thank you. So in this slide, um, basically you can see the agenda. Um, trying to give a structure to the presentation. We'll give a brief overview of the biography, the bibliography of the scholarly works of Professor Askari. Uh, it's a little bit odd for me to call him Professor Askari because everyone knows he was my grandfather uh, slash Nana Ba. So. If you don't mind, sometimes I may go on a tangent and call him Nana, but if it's OK with you, even though I will try to be respectful to the norm of either calling him Professor Askari or Askari Saab, but um, it will be a little bit challenging <laughs> in that sense. So hopefully you can understand. Yeah. So I will be also discussing the historiography project, which I started in 2015 and then what we have done in the last one year. This is my second presentation, so uh, the first one was in 2020, so in one year we accomplished a lot, but still a lot to be done. And then I will also share um, the future initiatives and projects for 2022 and beyond, you know. And then I will sort of close this presentation uh, with the final tribute and a closing statement. So that is the agenda for this presentation. Any questions here? No, I think you can go ahead. So I will start this presentation with a famous quote from one of Professor Askari's friend, Dr. J.N. Sarkar. And the way he defined and described Professor Askari and Nanaba was that he was considered as a single modern historian of Bihar who combined the roles of an explorer, archaeologist, Egoist with the of that historian, you know, so. It's a great definition and it really covers his whole scholarly personality and did a really nice job of. Defining uh, Lanaba. So going to the biography, you know, um, as everyone know, he was born in 1901. In the Saran district, um, his father died at an early stage um, when he was really young, and then his upbringing was by my grandmother, um, great grandmother, basically. Um, he was three brothers. Um, he was a really good student, uh, always secured first position. And the interesting thing was that he was basically aiming to become a lawyer. And when he graduated and went to the court, he just didn't feel comfortable with this whole atmosphere. So he decided that this is not the thing for him. And then he went into teaching and from teaching went into research and then the rest is history, as we all say, and he become a scholar, a legendary scholar. He was head of the department of the Patna College, also president of the medieval India section 
of the 10th session of the Indian History Congress, was the honorary director of the KP Jaiswal Research Institute from 62 to 69, and also received the honorary presidentship of the Regional Records Survey Committee from 81 to 88. Also, he was, he never did have PhD, basically. That was an interesting fact of his whole academic career. He did his master's, but never went for PhD. And, but he helped hundreds and maybe thousands to get their PhD degree based on his research work and the way he supported them. And in recognition of his efforts, he was basically given an honorary degree by University of Magad in 69 and then by Patna University in 84. So that is a very unique feature of his academic career. Trying to summarize this whole thing, but everything is online. Um, but this is a very quick synopsis of his brief biography. Did a little bit of a exploration myself by going through our shajras and trying to figure out the lineage. And it was interesting to see that uh, he was the 39th generation direct descendant of Prophet, Prophet Muhammad and also he was, his ancestry can be traced back to the eminent Sufi saint of the late 13th century, Hazrat Jalaluddin Surposh Bukhari. Very few people know about it, but try to compile all of this in this one slide, even though our Shajra is really huge. But again, this is a linear chart, so just wanted to share this with you just to give you an idea. Nanaba was recipient of a lot of awards and the main ones are listed here. Started with nine, Khan Saab in 1943. Um, that was not a really academic award. That was basically on his bravery where he basically guarded the university building for three nights and there were some riots going on and not a single building or not a, not a single building was destroyed and no one was hurt. So in recognition, of his bravery. The British government at that time awarded him Khan Saab title. He was never very proud of it because it was sort of a political at that time. Um, so very few people also know about this thing. Then in 87, he was awarded Bihar Ratna, 1990, Amra Patra. And then the main one was Padma Shri in 85 and this President's Certificate of Honor in 78 and the Ghalib Award in 74. So again, um, I have to say and admit that the Indian government and this at the national level, at the state level, recognize his scholarly works, which for which we are grateful to the at the government at the national and the state level. Any questions on this slide? Let me go to the next one. Since he did a lot of scholarly work in Persian, a lot of looked into the manuscripts. So he received an invitation letter by the late Shah of Iran, and this is the original one which you are seeing on the slide. Uh, it was given to my mother, um, second eldest daughter of Professor Askari or Nanaba. Um, and it is, I'm honored to have it in my pos possession. So you can see the original letter given by the Shah of Iran in 1971. Unfortunately, both Nanawa and Anima were unable to attend it um, because of his illness, you know. But again, just wanted to share this with you also. So going to his areas of expertise, and you may have heard from several scholars, it's very difficult to pigeonhole this whole thing that like what was his real areas of expertise? And if you start going through his publications, the scholarships. This, you cannot pinpoint one area. There are several areas. It starts from medieval Sufism, Delhi Sultanate, Mughals, regional history of Bihar, the culture and social history. And usually it varies from 12th to 18th centuries, you know, and then uh, did a lot of work on the biography of eminent Sufi saints, critical evaluation of historical and main sources, you know, 
and edited works on Mughal history. And then basically whatever was of his interest in finding new manuscripts, uh, new inscriptions, epigraphs, he will write an article and then he will move on, you know. So it was extremely challenging uh, in that sense to compile, locate his work because it, I wouldn't say it was all over the place, but it was really, uh, really diversified to an extent which was extremely um, unique and makes his whole scholarship unique also, you know. And also he did some book reviews also, which you will see in my later slides. Going to the next slide. This is basically the most, I would say the most pivotal and critical uh, attribute when I start going through his biography, bibliography, historiography. His passion was really exploration activities. You know, he will go and visit villages in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, look into epigraphs, look into his inscriptions, talk to people, go for the original source. Very few people, very few historians do that. You know, and they usually go and reference other works. He will go to the source and that also makes him extremely unique in his uh, methodology of researching and basically drafting scholarships, articles, research papers, you know, and due to this reason, he is still being honored in different journals and different by different scholars and historians, you know, and this was really his passion. If you really look into it, um, I was fortunate to get the Regional Records Survey Committee documentation from 1945 to 55, 61 to 62, 53 to 66, found some in the libraries of UCLS, found some in the University of Toronto Library. Um, it was extremely challenging to find those uh, documentation to validate it. And basically, if I look at it, he went after a thousand plus manuscripts and inscriptions, which is unbelievable, you know. So again, everything has been validated. Everything has been verified and cross-referenced. Any questions on this slide? No, I think no, I can can get so basically, so his whole art exploration was basically the stepping stone for his articles. Right now we we are able to only locate 250 plus articles which were published in 155 different magazines, journals, books, you know, and you can see the list of all the journals and books, mostly journals and magazines and proceedings where it has been published. Um, so basically, if you really, if I simplify this whole process, you will go and find those manuscripts, write an article on that one, move on to the next project. And that's unbelievable. People, usually historians and scholars will go and write a book, take it to the next level, come and then really focus on one thing. And that's how basically made it possible for him to go and explore uh, different manuscripts, research them. And that's how if you see it's like 250 plus papers, 190 plus in English language and Urdu language 60 plus. And the reason I have that plus sign is that every day I think that I have all his papers and the next day I find something different, you know, like more basically. So it has been a really ongoing rewarding experience. I must say that. But again, you can get an idea of how many journals which we have located so far where his articles have been published, you know. Again, uh, I will go through these slides very quickly. Um, if you see original sources, basically he did critical assessment of standard works around 23 articles and the list of these articles are here. They're also on the website. I wouldn't go through all of them, but you can get an idea. You know, one of them you can see Amir Khosro, which just pops out, you know, and then also in Maktubat-e-Sadi. Um, but again, 
Tajul Mahasir is one of them, which was really popular in most of the scholars in US and UK as come in addition to the scholars around the world. Again, he also brought new material to light from original sources. The first one, the Surah al -Amad, and then you can see the Ayatollah's Ahkam Alamgiri. And again, it's 15 plus. We are trying to find locate more also. It's still in the process, but again, these are the ones which have been located, scanned, digitized, and all of them have abstracts. Also, he wrote articles on political history, sort of general political history, and here's a list of all these articles which he have written on those uh, on the subject, you know. In this slide, again, this is more specific to Bihar. And again, 26 plus articles. Again, whenever I mention plus, that means we are still trying to locate more, but these have been located, identified, and abstracts have been drafted. Then he also focused on a couple of his articles on Bengal and Orissa. And again, this one is really interesting in the new light on Raja Ganesh and Sultan Ibrahim. And the reason I'm focusing on this one, because this one, it was extremely challenging for me to find this article. And because of this article, two years ago, I got connected with Dr. Professor Richard Eaton because I noticed that he has cited it in his book, Rise of Islam in Bengal. I sent him an email within 30 minutes. He replied back and now he is a great mentor and supporter of this whole project. I even met him, was telling Dr. Sunita Sharma that I met him a couple of days ago at his place. Didn't uh, He hosted me on a nice Christmas lunch and had some great discussions on the project. So this was, and that's how this article really stands out because a lot of other scholars have cited this article also. And then you can see the other category of the RSA political history. Going to the religious and cultural street, 21 plus articles, um, all of them are listed here. A uh, couple of them, we are still trying to find some uh, journals of current studies, which we have been sort of struggling, but Patna University journals mostly have been found, but again, it's part of the process that you have to locate, compile, verify, validate, and then post it, you know. So this one is extremely interesting in the sense is that it comes under the category of religious and cultural history in the Sikhism. And this, there was a encyclopedia which was published uh, and they basically have his 15 of his articles which none of his bibliography even mentioned it, you know, so that was a great find in uh, last year. Um, I was fortunate enough to find it and then thanks to Imtiaz Bhai, he was able to validate that also. And then with the help of the scholar from UC Berkeley, we drafted the abstracts, you know, so this was a great find, which was never part of his bibliography, uh, which was already published uh, in first in 50s and then in 69 and then in 2000, you know. And then we ran into issues how to classify these articles because they overlap. So we just said then multiple classifications, 15 plus articles. And then the one which I highlighted in red, um, Professor Sharma will attest to it that she basically referenced and cited that in her scholarship and I have a slide on that one also. Um, but again, you can see um, some of them we can't even classify properly, you know. So here's uh, in honor of the, to the of the team of the presentation of this whole memorial event today. Um, Professor Asfi's article, Nana Bas articles, Princess Zaiwan Nessa Facts and Friction, which was published by Kashi Prasad in this Bharati journal in 1988. Um, it was cited and referenced by Professor Sharma, and it's an honor for us that she is giving us the keynote speech also in her scholarship, which was published in 2004. And I was fortunate enough to find this book. This book is in like 36 different libraries all over the world, and you can see um, 
Nanaba's article was cited, um, sort of highlighted a couple of the citations here. But again, so on Sebunisa, daughter of Aurangzeb, um, again, there had been some myths about her, but overall, uh, you can see this abstract written on this article, which explains the whole thing that due to the political nature, you know, it, her reputation was a little bit challenging, but again, it's a very informative article. And I must say the scholarship by Dr. Sharma is even, she uh, did a really nice job of citing it in her book. Any questions on this slide? So Nanaba also did some reviews um, and here uh, her, his articles were classified under this section and you can see all these ones, um, at least 11 plus reviews. A um, couple of them we are still trying to locate. I believe we should be able to find them, uh, hopefully. Otherwise, um, it's going through the whole process as I mentioned earlier, you know. So he wrote a couple of articles on Kekadatta Saab also, and also Kaleem Saab, um, in Urdu and English. So again, very interesting articles. I will say some must read. At least these articles I was able to understand. The other ones, some of them really went over my head. So because of my lack of expertise in this whole arena, and every day I'm learning something new and trying to make it simple for everyone to understand also, you know. He also wrote introductions, four words and three faces, around 60 plus in different books. Um, some of the books were basically his scholarships where the authors took it to the next level and requested him to uh, honor their publication with his writing. In, the format of introduction or either introduce or to the foreword or the preface. So all of these have been located, scanned, digitized, available for anyone who has internet access, you know, and they're also already in Dropbox. So coming to this slide, I don't know how many people know. Another unique feature of Nanaba's whole academic and scholarship career. He never wrote a book basically. So around like 10 of his, 10 of the publications are his collected words in English and Urdu. Six of them are the volume editions which he did. One of them was really important where he did with uh, Professor Kiamatin Saab, father of Imtiaz Bhai, whom we call him uh, Kiam Kalu basically. And then four translations. Uh, of important manuscripts from Persian into English. So again, unique feature, never wrote a book in his entire life. And one of his famous quote was that writing a book is a sec sacred thing, which now I totally, totally appreciate his comment, you know, when I started working on this whole project. Then I will go through these slides very quickly. Uh, some of his collected works. Um, all of these books have been scanned, digitized, and all these articles basically have abstracts, you know. So this is part of his collected works, volume one. You can see the volume two on Amir Khosro. There are still a couple of articles which should have been added, but somehow didn't add. So hopefully when it gets republished, it will have a couple of more articles which he wrote on Amir Khosro. Uh, Khoda Bakhsh Library did a nice job of publishing it multiple times, but I think we need another publication which should uh, cover, which should add a couple of other articles also. Volume three was basic Islam in Muslims in Medieval Bihar. And then two of his articles, basically the Sufism in Medieval Bihar and Islam and Muslims in Medieval Bihar. Both of them have been cited in multiple scholarships and books all over the world. Then volume five in office, Jamil Kayat. Um, again, this is part of the volume five, which was published by Khudabash. Again, this was the lecture given at Kashi Prasad Institute. Um, again, you can see it's three lectures. 
and then we go into his Urdu articles, which were compiled by Khudabash Library. It, this volume has 10 of his articles. All of them have been scanned and digitized also with abstracts in English, basically. And I must commend the support of Imtiaz Bhai and his family for helping me out on this one. And then we did editing over here in the US. Again, another volume pr printed by published by Khuda Baksh. And this one has 35 of his articles in them. And then also um, Professor Hasnan basically, Hasnan Saab basically published Makalat Sayyid Hasan Askari, which has most of these articles which were published by Khuda Baksh and a couple of more articles, you know. So basically all these three books basically cover his articles which were published in journals like Maasir mostly, and now they are in these three scholarships. Now we go to the next portion where, where he did translations of the Russian manuscripts. Um, this one is really popular in most of the scholars in U US and Europe when I started doing digital searches, you know, like who has been citing it. And again, um, everyone knows about this one, so at least it's a matter of pride for us to say that this one has been digitized and also we have a summary also of this one. But again, give you an idea that locating it and then going through this whole um, book and hopefully we can publish it again because it's very difficult to find this book. But again, it's available in a Dropbox and anyone can access it. The second one was the Kate Babri. Um, everyone knows that it deals with that Mughal rule coinciding with the Babri's reign, 1526 to 1530. Uh, on the right hand side, you will see that book which we acquired, and then the left side, a little bit of a summary of the book published in 82. The third one was the Iqbal Lama, and it basically covers the history of the Mughals down to the reign of Muhammad Shah, 1790 to 1748, um, published in 83. Again, extremely popular with most of the historians here. Going to this one where uh, Professor Askari Nanaba basically did his introduction and compilation sort of under goes under the edition uh, section and again, gives you an idea it was printed it was published in 74 and after that which i was already shared then the translation was done in 80s you know uh this was a big project given to nanaba in 1970s um uh, he was a journal editor of this one um his introduction was basically 20 plus pages and covered a mult multitude of topics uh, very interesting read you when you really look into the whole source letters at that time, you know, so. So coming to this one, everyone knows about most of the people knows about this whole comprehensive history of Bihar, which was published in volume one, two and three, the ancient, the medieval and the modern. So Nanaba and Imtaz Bhai's father, Professor Qiyamuddin Saab, basically worked together. They edited this. Uh, it has their articles also and articles of some of the other scholars also. So this was a major undertaking in 83 and 87. Uh, published in 87, just a couple of years before Nanaba passed away. But again, I was fortunate to locate these in one of the bookshops in Delhi and get it shipped over here and then went through the whole thing. So. I'm glad I have the original book. So this was a recent find. Um, it wasn't part of the whole bibliography one. When we went through the whole cataloging of Khuda Baksh, we found out that he did some compiling and editing on this um, edition of the manuscript for Sherfuddin Ahmed Yamaneri. Uh, extremely interesting, um, gives you an insight. And then when you start reading Father Paul Jackson's scholarship also, it all starts adding up and making sense. So again, compile that, got the soft copy also. 
Uh, now I'm getting the hard copy shortly, but uh, I'm fortunate to have the soft copy. See the Feroz Chai. This is an interesting one here. Basically, the whole manuscript was edited by him, and this project was given initially by Prime Minister Nehru uh, to have this manuscript translated into from Persian into English. So the first publication was basically publishing the manuscript. And um, so Nanava wrote the introduction, he did the editing and it got published. He started working on the translation in the 60s and 70s. And this one was the real challenge of this whole histography project. Where this one, we could not even locate the manuscript for the last three years. It got lost three or four times, didn't get published the whole translation. And when I go to that one, I will share some good news with you. But this uh, original manuscript with his notes were published in 1999, um, nine years after his death. But again, this entire edition and the translation, the publication were one of those things which were really on our radar screen that get it published, you know. So, uh, and now this is the final slide for this series of Feroz Shai. I can share this with you that it finally got published. Five copies were given to Khudabash Library. I'm getting one of them. It's in the mail. I got the PDF copy um, in May, and I have to really commend Imtiaz Bhai to for assisting me in finding the manuscript, working with Khuda Baksh, and getting it published after 40 years. You know, so this is a huge thing for the historiographic project. I wish we all wish that it was published in Nanamba's life, but for some multitude of multitude of reasons, it never got published. But we've and the manuscript got lost three or four times, and finally this translation is published. Uh, the production copies should be available, I believe, next year. We have already placed order for 50 copies to be distributed free of cost to all the libraries, including Library of Congress and all the scholars in US, UK, and some of the scholars in India also. So again, great news. We are waiting for the official launch date from Kodabash Library. Should happen next month um, or early next year. But we have the soft copy and we also have the first batch of the hard copy also. So everyone knows Nanava passed away at the age of 89 in 1990. Everyone thought it was the end of an era. It was not really an end of an era. We started a new chapter. And we started this whole histography project in 2015. And the reason for starting this histography project was that it was a personal thing. And the story behind it that in 2015, a group of cousins, including me on a WhatsApp group, were discussing about the life and the career and the scholarly works of Nanaba. And then we all realized that we don't have a good handle on it. Nobody knows the entire scholarly works. So I took it on myself um, and started researching his works, went through different scholarships and books print, published by others. His 30 biographies he published in French and English and a couple of authors in India and US and UK. And from there, I basically created the whole list. And then after that, I realized that this is a digital area and we need to do take it to the next level, make it accessible to everyone, whatever the findings are. So histography project again launched in 2015. And I will take you to the next slide and give you a brief overview of the histography project. So the, the premise of this project was locate all his works, compile them, draft it, digitize it, scan it, 
and then basically use the digital sites like Facebook, official website, created his official website, created Dropbox online, created Instagram page, created YouTube channel. Just so if because right now. The unfortunate thing is that people are you will find people more on their cell phones and tablets and laptops instead of really going to the libraries and getting books from the libraries. So wanted to make it easier for all the scholars and also for the family and the friends to access his work, read his work and then preserve his work also so people can easily cite them, you know, so that was the purpose because the journals which were published in the 30s and 40s and 50s, they are extremely hard to get. And they are not really accessible and. In this current atmosphere, his articles, if you look into his articles, they didn't have any abstracts, didn't have the keywords. So we also wrote abstracts on all of his articles uh, with the help of this. Uh, scholars in UC Berkeley uh, and also I must commend him as by also helped me with that, you know, in validating it. Um, so again, it gives you an idea of the whole histography project, you know. Any questions on this slide? So in this slide, a quick overview started this project in 2015, 2016 launched the author Facebook page. Then kept on locating and compiling his list of books and articles. And then I realized that Facebook is not very user friendly, you know, and some of the people are not a big fan of Facebook also. So we want to take it to the. Make it to a platform where everyone can access it and can easily navigate navigate and find his work. So created a website uh, which has 20 pages and then in 2020 uh, wrote the abstracts with analysis and reviews of his works, you know. In 2021. This year. We developed his Instagram page, launched it, YouTube channel um, and also worked with the Recta group. They requested me an article on his profile, his academic career. So. Uh, so Recta, Sufi Nama, both those sites have some of his works and there's a brief article on him also. So far 19 books have been uploaded to Dropbox. One of them. The Fort William one is. We are trying to locate that one to have it scanned. I have the original copy. Uh, once we have the approval, we will get it scanned and uploaded. So 19 out of 20 books have been digitized, scanned and already in Dropbox and then. 234 out of 250 articles are also in Dropbox. Anyone can download it and access it free of cost. So the goal is to make it as easy as possible. And then onwards, you know, keep on finding his new works as well as republication of his works in hard copy so it can be uh, submitted to all the libraries because uh, so we are covered from all bases. So here is this official website and you can see his official website. It has a home page. Um, then one page is dedicated for the chronological events, then his awards and recognition, books, articles, abstracts. If this are are basically abstracts for his articles in Urdu language, then the reviews done on his work by other scholars, his biography and his biography. It's in English, it's in French. And it's in German also, and I have to thank Nida Ahmed for helping me for the German version. Uh, she's daughter of Dr. Mtiaz Ahmed. And then on the French version, a scholar, Dr. Catherine, shared her biography, which she published in uh, late 1990s. And then the English version has been compiled with the UC Berkeley scholar, Dr. Hannah Archimbald. And then a page on exploration, how he explored what our resources he had. And then in one of the pages, whatever photographs we have after validating it and making it converting into high resolution, we posted all those photographs there. There's still some to be posted. And then a brief overview of the histography project, 
then memories like how people remember him and then 14 news and events any newspaper clippings and events like this one will be posted there and already posted there you know then sources so in any project everyone will ask okay where am i getting all this material you know so list all the sources there that right now i will say it's like 1500 sources but again um wanted to make sure whatever I'm posting, it's validated and I can reference it and cite it to the accurate source, you know, because as a family member, we can get a little bit personal, a little bit emotional also, but here this project, one needs to maintain their objectivity and that's why this source section is really important. Uh, the page locations basically tell you where his books are, which library has it. The world catalog gives you access to all of those. So if someone wants to read his book to a library, he can just go to this page and that and he can search for that book and that with that link, he can go to that library wherever uh, he is, you know, or she is. And then the acknowledgements where I thanked all the 60 plus scholars and students and volunteers who helped me and also the researchers and historians that without their support, their guidance, their mentorship, um, this wouldn't be possible. Uh, and then the feedback which was received from different organizations, scholars, historians on this whole project, they're all listed there. And then the about page is basically about a uh, little bit about myself, the whole project uh, to give a little bit of validity to this initiative. And then created a page for links where all the important links are there. So if one wants to find the only the link for Facebook page or the YouTube or the Dropbox, it's all there. In the end, you know, if someone wants to contact me for anything, it, it, I can be contacted on this one, you know. Again, the reviews page has uh, at least nine reviews. The news and events has 40 clippings and events and the photographs, at least 25 photographs are there in group photographs and his portrait photographs. Locations. I would say 5,000 different locations have his books and articles, and it's I have only listed, I think, not more than 100 or 200, but again, everything has to be validated, but again, it's all over the world. And then the sources where I've obtained a lot of information is 1,500 plus sources. Um, and then the memories, 100 plus different scholars, researchers, historians, friends, family, whoever have met him, try to document it all over on this page, you know. So coming to what we did in the last one year after the presentation last year, created his Instagram page because now Instagram is becoming more popular with young scholars as compared to Facebook. So now Instagram page has his books. We will be uploading his articles there also, but at least it has a link to his website and other pages also. Then also created his YouTube channel where this event is there and then other events and anyone who has done some interviews, we will be posting it over there. Also worked with Rekta Sufi Nama and then created a Sufi Nama blog for his works. So Rekta Sufi Nama has some of his works, not all of them. And the goal is that uh, they should be given access and then they should be uploading all his works over there. So whatever we can do to share it on multiple platform, that's the goal. Um, because his entire work belongs to the academia and the general readership, not to one person, not to one group, uh, not to anyone. It's for the global audience. So this is the major project we are working on. Um, so we did a lot of stuff on the digital side. Now we want to do something on as a hard copy and publish a official biography, bibliography, histography. And here basically, initially I reached out to Dr. Imtiaz Ahmed Imtiaz by is here also to get his help on the histography and get his guidance to be an oversight on this whole project because if I can say he is the living authority on Professor Askari Nanaba and basically um, he's a living encyclopedia on him also. Um, 
And then also I worked with the UC Berkeley's ex-professor Hannah Archambault, who wrote the biography also and worked with him on writing all the abstracts of his work. So basically trying to compile everything in this book. Um, we have shortlisted a publisher also. And the goal is to get it published in. Basically, I would say next year. Um, and I would like to thank Professor Eaton if he is listening, you know that he was nice enough to wrote the foreword for this book. Um, so on the left hand side, you will see the front cover and the back side. I designed it myself. I know it will get changed by the publisher, but again, the thing is that this will be funded by the historiography project self funded. Not a money making project here. We want to bring all his works into this hard copy format and the ebook format so it can be part of the libraries all over the world, you know. And here's a sneak preview of the contents. And it's in six different sections. And you can see all these sections with subcontents over here and gives you an idea that it's a very comprehensive volume and covers biography, historiography, as mentioned earlier, and then his abstracts also, and the bibliography of his publications and the testimonials by eminent scholars. Uh, and then basically ending it with the part six and part seven uh, with the sources. But again, took a very novel approach. Um, most of the information is already on the website, but wanted to give it a book format. And this is the goal that hopefully. It gets published in 2022. Uh, this whole COVID thing made it very challenging and delayed this project because my goal was to get it published this year. But again, you know, man proposes, God disposes, and it didn't really happen. And I wasn't really very, very happy about it. But again, it's on the radar screen. It's our top initiative and we will push it and I will personally push it to get it published in 2022. So the next question is what will happen after this publication? The next goal is that we will go for volume two in 2023. Republish all his scholarly works of 20 books and 250 in hard copy paperback formats under the little under the latest digital formats in multiple section and phases um, because most of his books were typewritten. Uh, didn't follow the right format also at that time, so we want to republish this whole thing. Um, and in ebook format and hard copy uh, as mentioned earlier. So that is the goal. That's a major undertaking. And it's an uphill task. We have come a long way since 2015. And I'm confident with the support of all these scholars, historians, and eminent personalities, we will get it done. It will just a matter of time and just stay staying focused, you know. So that's it's on the roadmap, and that's our future project. So in this slide, you can see scholars in USA, UK, professionals, librarians, eminent historians try to list as much as possible with the photographs from USA, UK, India, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Switzerland, Germany, France, you name it. They have been all very supportive and giving me feedback, guidance. Whenever I reach out to them, I will get an email or a phone call. Or sometimes I will just meet them in person. So at least on this slide, I'm taking a step. I'm trying to pause here and want to thank all of them because without their support, it wouldn't be possible, you know. And then some more basically I listed here. And you can see all of these scholars recently, which were not on the first slide because that slide was getting really busy, you know, so I thought I should at least list this and I will still say there's still some missing photographs, which there will be another slide which will be added. Um, but again, you will get an idea. At least 60 plus have been helping them. And one thing I must mention that I didn't add 
the photographs of my family members and relatives and friends because they have also been an integral part of this project. So I'm almost coming to an end to this presentation and here I would like to take a pause. And in honor of Nana Ba, I would like to share these slides that eminent historians like Professor Habib from Aligarh, Professor Carl Ernst, Professor Peter Jackson from UK, Professor Dr. Jute Falash from Germany, and then Professor Dr. Blaine uh, or from Switzerland, you know, the way they have remembered Tanaba, his works. And these are five of them, but again, I have like 70 plus similar from other historians and scholars and professionals. But again, I would take a moment here so you can read it. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing because I'm trying to be sensitive. I may have um, exceeded the time limit here. But again, you can see that even now, after 30 years, he is still being remembered with high regards. So again, this light can share, can show you and validate my statement earlier. Um, you can see on the left hand side, um, Dr. Kamadi Ahmed, Professor Kamadi Ahmed Saab, whom we used to call Kam Khalu, father of Mtiaz Bhai. Um, basically, he has been very close to Nana Ba, did an excellent job on the entire bibliography project in 60s and then in 2000 also, which was published in 2000, even though he passed away in 1998. He was extremely close to Nana Ba. He was like a son to him. And then basically, I must say that if I would not have read his work, this project would not be possible for me. So his couple of his articles on Nana Ba really were a stepping stone for me to take it to the next level. So again, I know both these personalities are no longer with us, but I believe they are in spirit and Again, I heartfelt thanks to uh, Kam Khalu for this one. So I also got in contact with Dr. Catherine Escher, very famous historian based in Minnesota. And according to Professor Eaton, Nanaba considered her like her own daughter. She used to visit him in 80s. Nanaba, Father Paul Jackson, her husband, Professor Rick Asher, uh, even Camp Hollow, they will go uh, to different sites, look into inscriptions. Um, I'm really fortunate to be in contact with her. We usually exchange emails once a month. Um, and she had been a great mentor to me, you know. So again, taking a small pause here and you can read her comments here, you know. Sometimes I would, we would joke that she was his American daughter, you know. Well, Professor Bruce Lawrence, eminent historian, distinguished scholar. And again, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, you can see he has been a big fan of Nanaba's work. He met him in 1970s. And if you have read uh, Father Paul Jackson's Shurf, 100 Letters of Shurf within Maneri, he worked with Nanaba on that one with Father Paul Jackson. And that's how I got introduced to him. Again, extremely nice person, very down to earth. Um, whenever I approached him, always gave me good suggestions and connected me to other experts in this field also. Again, don't have the words to thank him, but again, you can see still after 30 years, um, regards him in a higher position and place, you know. And last, and the slide, which again, Professor Richard Eaton. 
I have met so many people in my entire life, but I have never seen a person like Professor Eaton, who is such a down to earth person, very supportive. And again, highly responsive and great mentor for me, um, great guide for me. And when I approached him a couple of years ago and when I met him several times, um, again, every time I met him, always learned new things and again, has been an integral part of the histography project. You have seen that he has wrote the foreword for us in the Omnibus Volume 1. And again, I really don't have the words to thank him. But you can see the way he and others have been remembering him, you know, so. With this slide, I would like to thank. Dr. Uh, Sunita Sharma for attending this, Dr. Imtiaz Ahmed to managing it, the director, Dr. Suman Saab, and the entire staff of Bihar State Archive who had been managing this event, organizing this event for the last five to six years. Again, uh, hats off to you, to all of you guys. And again, without you guys, we would have lost most of this documentation and we would not be remembering him, but you guys have created this whole platform to remember none of us on behalf of the family, the friends, the relatives, and the histography project. My heartfelt and sincere thanks to all of you. Thank you. God bless you. Thanks a lot. बहुत 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 सैयद सैयद राजा राजा साहब अभी हम भी हम लोग हमारे राजा राजा साहब सर से चर्चा कर रहे हैं साहब साहब व्यक्ति के बारे में बारे में विस्तार विस्तार एवं उनके द्वारा जो कार्य किए गए हैं सभी को सैयद हमारे राजा साहब एक जगह शंकलित कर आगे बढ़ने का काम कर रहे हैं कार्यक्रम को आगे बढ़ाते हुए आज के कार्यक्रम की मुख्य वक्ता डॉक्टर सुनीता शर्मा मैम से मैं आग्रह करूंगा कि मैम आप आभासी मंच पर उपस्थित हैं कृपया कर अपना माइक ऑन कर लें और आज के स्मृति व्याख्यान का विषय है आइडेंटिफाइंग द फेमिनाइन ट्रेडिशन ऑफ टेमोरिज सिविलाइजेशन उस पर आज हम लोग डॉक्टर सुनीता शर्मा मैम से दो शब्द सुनेंगे मैम माइक ऑन कर लें मैम माइक माइक ऑफ है माइक ऑफ है मैम माइक ऑफ है एक के सिन्हा सर को मेरा प्रणाम है सर को अभी देख रहा आवाज आ रही है जी मैम एम आई ऑडिबल एम आई ऑडिबल ना जी मैम आपकी आवाज आ रही है जी थैंक यू अशोक जी रिस्पेक्टेड चेयरपर्सन प्रोफेसर इम्तियाज अहमद former director Kodabaksh Oriental Public Library director directorate of Bihar State Archives Shri Suman Kumar for giving me this opportunity I acknowledge the presence of professor Sayyad Hasan Askari's family members his grandson Sayyad Ahmad Raza who has contributed with project on historiography and very commendable work. We are overwhelmed with the work that has been carried out. And the, we are looking forward to the omnibus volume that would be coming soon. I feel honored and humbled to have been asked to speak on Professor Sayyad Hassan Askari's memorial lecture. 
Professor Askari has been one of the tallest figures in the field of medieval Indian history, an explorer, researcher, and a teacher who continues to inspire us. His foundational work has essentially been on medieval Bihar and Sufism. Many mystic tracts and epistles have been brought before us by him. In fact, in Sayyid Athar Abbas Rizvi's work on history of Sufism in India, not only is his work cited, but the author relies on the work of Professor Askari, particularly in the Firdausi community of Bihar. I too have dealt with one of his work on Zebu Nisa as far as studies in or concerning women is concerned. However, I have contextualized it in the later part of my work. I pay tribute to Professor Askari's profound knowledge. I present my paper on identifying the feminine traditions of Timurid civilization, conjoining gender and culture, the select elements of Timurid civilization. It has allowed me to look for fresh insights. The paper seeks to construct a history of aristocratic, albeit or imperial women from Timurid dynasty who were inextricably linked to the cultural and political life of the Mughals who are placed here as a discursive site as it seeks to establish the centrality and accord to it the place due in the making of Mughal Imperium. I say discursive site because women are put here in a random form in their various manifestation. Therefore, this methodology has been taken up by me. Taking this trajectory or path, I feel, would allow us to locate women in the Mughal culture, creating a fresh insight as to how it impacted the Mughal public political affairs. In this course, the feminist historians have tried to challenge the conventional orientalist interpretation of the domestic or harem life to dispel some of the ambiguities of Mughal life within the harem and courtly practices. I would also add that some of the biased Western ideas and perspectives created about women that they operated within a fixed zone of influence that is the harem. And we would try to represent the fluidity of it. The household matrix deeply influenced the political opinions and decisions of their women counterparts right from the formative years of Babur to the crystallization of Mughal authority, say from the time of Akbar to the later period. Weber, on his readings of Aine Akbari holds the view that uh, household was the central element in government. And this view is upheld by F. Richards, Burtonstein, Blake, and other historians. Rosalind also is of the view that household was important and she gives attention to the essential gender dimension in her investigation of imperial politics and identity. To her, imperial household was the crucial domain after which images of other realms of the empire were to be built. She also points out to the gradual development of patriarchal power in pre-modern society or pre-colonial period. So citing the role of the institutionalization of the imperial policies was often shaped by the valued opinions of women, mostly in direct or indirect forms. 
one can posit a domain or postulate it of domestic life as a heuristic device. That is, you can have your own way of investigation. This is a realm in which women have more presence and the domestic life can be marked as inseparable in other activities, whether it was some pains. We notice it during the time of Humayu and how policies changed after his uh, fall in Chaucer. The display of power at Mughal court and their being adept in diplomacy and statesmanship. Examples can be cited of Khanazad Begum, of Salima Sultan, of Jahara, and of the intercessions to prevent civil wars. The Timurid culture gave women a definitive edge over others. And this factor I would emphasize upon. Not only were their viewpoints considered, but the women enjoyed high positions. Dildar Agacha, one of the wives of Babur, who did not belong to the higher rank, was still given the governorship of Bulandashahir, as has been cited in the writings of uh, Annette Susan Beveridge, where she did her work on Humayun Nama, a monumental work of Gulbadan Begum. And we find that they were not isolated from political life on account of gender. It was the Timurids culture of acceptance that gave women the recognition of their individuality. I intend to emphasize more on this subtle yet liberal and distinctive aspect of the Timurids by comparing their position to the Ottomans, Safavids and the Mongols, looking at their feminine traditions as well and their femin uh, the female counterparts as well. As in the invocation of religious, cultural and political ideologies, these dynasties had different approaches. The Safavid harem was a complex institution where the imperial women exercised their authority, their patrimonial rights, and all descendants could rule, whether male or female, at least in theory, or at least in the initial formative years. To Maria Suze, politics was a natural domain for women. And it is said also that the women from the imperial household were elevated to sainthood and it had an air of sanctity. I would like to join this aspect, this theory with the Mughals as well when Hamida Bano, the wife of Humayun and mother of Akbar was married to Humayun on this ground that she hailed from the saintly family of Ahmed Jami. So this was a crucial factor which integrated the Persian and the Mughals together. Coming down to the Ottoman, the Ottoman women's public culture of sovereignty prevailed. These are the ideas that has been worked upon I would say by Leslie Pierce when she writes the imperial harem women and sovereignty in Ottoman Empire and by Kishwar uh, Rizvi when she talks about gendered patronage, then they are the historians or the feminist historians who look at the Ottoman and moral fiber and institutional integrity of the Ottomans, particularly in the time of Suleiman, the contemporary, one of the contemporary rulers of Babur, where he brings to the forefront one of his con concubines, Harim, and she's given the title of Haseki, or the powerful uh, wife, and uh, 
is also uh, seen to have validated the Valide Sultan because they became prominent not only as powerful wives, but as powerful mothers as well. The whole concept of one mother, one son was then to see or to move in a different direction. Coming down to the Mongols, they depicted a strong cultural and spiritual association with the female element of water. Where there was scarcity of water, we find this association and giving it a feminine attribute. Women occupied a unique position and received the title of Khan or Beki. This title, which was given to the son-in-laws, was given as Prince Consort. So the independent authority that was given to the Mongol women and the whole concept that the royal family came to be known as the Altan Urug, the golden womb, and proclaimed equality in marriage. So these are the concepts that we want to raise. And these ideologies and practices amongst the Ottomans, Safavids, and Mongols later remained more in name. And it was the Timurid who carried it forward. We would say that we are not suggesting coming together of different uh, dynasties of different traditions in one easy synthesis or in conflict. We are just trying to bring forth the Islamic world and how it looked at its women. Here also, I would say that uh, Catherine Bebian's work is of immense importance and the work of Jack Weatherford who is uh, also associated with the Chinggis Khan University and staying there and having a feel of the cultural ethos of the Mongols has presented these views to us. And of course, the work of Rashiduddin Fazullah in his compendium of Chronicles, he talks about the secret history of the Mongols. And by here, with the secret history, we understand the women's. Uh, Um, briefly, I would also like to indulge myself in the Timurids carefully, who carefully nurtured the old perso chinggis symbology of the sun. And many of the authors, modern authors like Ira Mukoti, they have written a book, Daughters of the Sun. So in the genealogy created by Abul Fazl for Akbar, the Mughals traced their lineage through Timur and Chinggis Khan to Princess Alankova, who was impregnated by the divine light of the sun. The imagery of this powerful radiance was burnished by each successive emperor and used to stake their claims and mitigate their status. Shah Jahan took the enigmatic title Sahib Kiran, stating his claim of lighting the Timurid lamp. Many of the Timurid women too placed themselves within the warm orbit of the sun. They consciously evoked the symbol of the sun. When Mehrunisa took the title of Noor Jaha, Mumtaz Mahal came to be known as son of modesty. It was the old Timurid ideal that the women aspired to when Jahara wrote her Sufi treatises. I'll be talking later about it and discovered a shining truth. And it was Timurid lamp once again that shone through her, followed by Zebun Nisa. In Sufi psyche, the feminine exists as an ideal, which Rumi refers to as a ray of God. The feminine is not the earthly mortal female, but represents the creative feminine emanation of the divine through which the Sufi devouts achieve an understanding and union with God. And thus the Sufi ethos, this Sufi ethos is well reflected in Jaha'ara and Zebunisa. Scholars are now 
increasingly engaging with the discourses on Mughal culture within a very restrictive gender framework and are acknowledging the significance of representing women's expressive cultures in all its plenitude despite the restrictions faced by them. And we are informed about it primarily in the work of Gulbadan Begum. Gender ideology operates in societies not necessarily through external forces, but rather the internal restraint that is built within a woman and with a firm belief that they have in themselves in the existential theory that an individual must create their own being, the first being Hamida Bano Begum, about whom I'll refer to later as well, that their own space, they have to have their own specific situation and environment. The interplay of the various socio-political, cultural and ideological facets of identity politics practiced in their everyday life comes before us to make a new assessment about the lives of these women. Their role cannot be created based on a simplistic structure of women being looked upon as agents, as subjects of social process, but now there's been placed within the studies of power because personal is political. So the case study, the individual studies also brings forth this concept that personal is political. I would also say that I would not limit myself to the initial definitional, definitional nodes of binaries of public private. It's a very common uh, idiom that we take or a binary that we have of public private or rather its dichotomy. The socialist feminist historians looked anew from a new vantage point of sexuality and patriarchy. In this, Cynthia Nelson has looked at the wide ranging ethnographic instances to show how women negotiated their social order in different ways, in their own ways, I would say rather. Therefore, taking an ideological as well as an experiential stance would allow us to question, to interrogate the quiddities, the everydays of the culture practiced in the name of tradition. The normative practices were provided generous space in the cultural narrative, while the denormativizing of the patriarchal formulations in the cultural writings of the Mughal period is now being focused on the in the recent writings and interpretations and providing fresh insight to engage, represent and construct the multiple realities which we term as ontology of women, society and polity is there to remove their invisibility. They are ubiquitous, but they are invisible. This dichotomy needs to be looked into. The role of women in perpetuation of culture makes a close study of harem life. It cannot be based on oversimplification, essentialism, reductionism or stereotyping as acts of unconscious subversion has been resisted from time to time by women of exceptional abilities to bring out the distinctive features who stood for self-choice, self-determination, self-causation, they are to be rendered as persons in their own rights, truly to be regarded as an individual. In their role as ambassadors, Khanazad Begum, peacekeepers, Salima Sultan, and as guardians of memory, the historian Gulbadan Begum, it was the Timurid Chingazid ideal that these Mughal women claimed their advice at times, 
kept the empire intact. Khanazad Begum, because of the sacrifice made by her, she was left behind with Uzbegi warlord Shaibani Khan to secure Babur's safety. And in her later years, she acted as an ambassador and left from Kandahar to Kabul as Padshah's ambassador. And they are given this public position right when we are talking about the formative years of the Mughals. Like Dildar Agacha, as I've mentioned, uh, she was given a position in the peripatetic regime of the Mughals. Gulbadan Begum, the historian, not only a woman historian, a female historian, but I would say that she is the historian of Kutodian life, the social, familial aspects that has been documented and therefore she brings about the Mughal personal life in Humayunama and the politics behind it. And she brought about mess many lesser known facets and complexities of the polygamous society in all its cultural hues. Hamida Bano dispels the notion of a subservient woman. And this aspect was brought to my notice at first by Professor Qayamuddin Ahmad when he brought forth this theory of Kofu of granting equal status, equal rank to a person in marriage who would not be subservient. And therefore, I've just let it forward. And she came to be revered by Akbar as Maryam Makani. But in the whole uh, play of it, we would notice that he himself becomes the superior authority by making her Mother Mary and himself being the uh, creator. So when we come down to Salima Sultan's second rung of diplomacy, because she averted civil war, but she's learned person, huge library, uh, even uh, the historian like uh, the contemporary of Abul Fazl uh, has Badayuni was reprimanded as he has not returned one of her books. So the authority that they had, the academic acclaim that we can lay to them is very much justified. Coming down to Mahamananga, uh, Vanisa Mahir in her work, Breastfeeding, the Anthropology of Breastfeeding, Natural Law or Social Construct. She emphasizes that she hailed from the same saintly family of Ahmad Jami, which gave her access to Mughal polity, so much so that she could outmaneuver Bairam Khan, the architect of the Mughal restoration. And even after that, for a brief period that she was very influential in the politics of the Mughals. She has been referred to in official correspondence as Valida, and it has been brought to us in the writings of Abul Fazl. So a study of these representative figures who stood for assertion. It breaks away from the stereotypical projection of women as Mughal women as non-agentic, with aberrations of Noor Jaha and Jaha Ara, two extraordinary personalities. So these studies, the recent studies, I would say, emphasize upon the multi-dimensional role of many of the women who did not gain prominence in the recorded mainstream history, but nevertheless contributed to the evolution of refined Mughal culture. The Mughal women generally represented as homogeneous entities does not hold true. They had their own ethnography. Each woman personage had their own distinctive characteristic, but all in different ways enriching the feminine elements of the Timurids. I would now emphasize upon Jahara and Zebunisa. Jahara or the Sahibat Uz Zamani, like Pari Khanam of the Safavid dynasty, who was given the title of Zamani and uh, Alafa as the uh, Afifa, sorry, uh, as being 
very saintly and powerful. Such titles was given to a princess. She was not a queen and her allowance of four lakhs of rupees, the trade ships, Shahi and Ganjavar, title of Padshah Begum, superseding many of the other Mughal women, when her influence was endless, but she came out of the tumult of the imperial Zanana when she turned towards Sufism. The two Sufi treatises, Munisul Arva in 1639-40, followed by Risale Sahibiya 1640-41, attributed to Jahara Begum's authorship needs to be placed in larger social, religious and political contexts. The treaties can be analyzed to consider issues of identity, spirituality and gender. The quotient of her spiritual authority and the theory, I would repeat, of divine effulgence as a function of a piety to light the Timurid light eternally. She attains the same exalted status of Sahibe Kiran Isani, taken up by Timur, emulated by Shah Jahan. Jahara seeks eternity, which is not based on imperial power, but lies embedded in her spiritual prowess through her Sufi works. Her Sufism turned to be a fundamental factor to construct an enduring and legitimate power in the sacred realm and allowed the Sufi ideology to transcend social, religious, gender boundaries. And in that sense, we can term it secular as well in Mughal India to create an inclusive and widely represented religious community. The women, from Mughal royal family bore the responsibility for visibilizing the spirituality of the dynasty through Sufi practice, but also through the patronage of sacred and secular monuments. Jaha'ara's architectural commissions are physical enunciations of a Sufi piety and spiritual persona. We would say, that Zebun Nisa is also a woman of letters like Jaha'ara with the same Sufi inclinations. She was the eldest daughter of Dilras Banu Begum, one of the last who belonged to the same saintly Ahmad Jami family from Iran, from where Hamida Banu Begum hailed, from where Maham Ananga came and who was selected to feed Akbar on the basis of her lineage, which the Mughals always held in awe. Zebun Nisa's maternal lineage was also from this family. She was given a rigorous education under many reputed scholars and educationists. The first being Hafiza Maryam, because it was at the age of seven that Zebun Nisa could recite the Quran by memory and she became a Hafiza. 30,000 gold mohars were distributed. The Maidan where the event was celebrated was with great pomp. The second preceptor of Zebun Nisa was Mullah Saeed Ashraf Mazandarani, again an Iranian scholar about whom Professor Askari has also given a lot of detailed information. And he mentions that when an ordinary mortal, a maid of the Mughal harem, broke a Chinese mirror which fell into pieces on which she was lamenting and fearful, to which Akhund Saeed replied, that it was quite good that the cause of becoming self-conceited is gone. The Sufi ideology lies underneath and it definitely cast an influence on Zebun Nisa. Her third preceptor under Shah Rustam Ghazi, she studied astronomy and mathematics. 
it is an unique aspect, a unique feature because her academic interest lay in science. It also reflects her scientific temperament, which can be seen in the religious discourses of hers. She had a very sweet voice. She could sing. And at a time when Aurangzeb had banned the musicians, they were the spirit who carried the musical trend, the musical folklore. So she contributes towards that side as well. She built a massive library. We can see the impulse given towards education at Delhi. It contained several volumes written by scholars on law, theology, history and literature. The, she employed skilled calligraphers and scribes to copy rare and valuable books for her library. She had set up a scriptorium under her personal guidance. We find it during the early period of the caliphate or the third phase of the caliphate when it had been stabilized and many of the works of translation were going on between India and the Arab world. So the tradition of these intellectual activities we find is being carried by the women of the Mughal world and the feminine traditions can thus be traced in the liberal atmosphere that was given to them. It is said that it was a tradition of the Timurids, which we can see with Gulbadan Begum, Salima Sultan, Jahara and others who all had their own libraries. They were avid readers. They could write, they could contextualize and contribute immensely to the literature, history and writings of the time. Zebun Nisa too supported the scholars and amongst them I would name Mullah Safid Uddin Adbeli when he translated the Arabic tafsir -e kabir the great commentary of Fakhruddin Razi into Persian and dedicated the book to Zebun Nisa as Zebu Tafsir. She herself was the compiler of a letters called Zebul Munshat, which has become extinct as informed by Askari, by Professor Askari. Her poetical effusions in Persian with her nom de plume Makhfi has been confused with those in the Divan of Rishti Irani, whose pen name was also Makhfi, the concealed one. It was a very popular pen name that was taken by people at that time. So Zebunisa emerges as a patron who nurtured the eclectic maelstrom of a culture. The whirlpool of literary activities can be seen in her time. She handled some contentious theological issues since she was not of orthodox disposition and like Jahara was of sophistic bent of mind. One religious dispute was resolved by her the copies of which were sent to Iran and Turan. And the, she, her fame spread as a renowned scholar in the western part of Asia as well. Professor Askari, as I've mentioned earlier, used the heuristic device, traced a valuable letter that she wrote to her father from the prison at the age of 40, is found in the manuscript and which he happened to locate among many other collections of royal letters in the supplement of Kalimate, Tayyabat, Yade, Beza, and Sarve Azad, Gulam Ali Azad, Bilgrami, and where the work is devoid of the Makfi name and could be located and identified particularly as the work of Zebunisa. So uh, here we would uh, add that Zebunisa's sudden fall from gaze, grace was disturbing her. She sought forgiveness from her father. Her filial duties like Jahara knew no bounds. And this is one reason that in the Western concept perception, they have been maligned and uh, to Jahara, a kind of um, 
um, maligning that was made that uh, can only be seen in the biased writings of the European travelers. We would say that Professor Askari gave the reason for her imprisonment. As Zebu Nisa's letters were recovered, an act which went against Aurangzeb, the ruler and the state. Was it due to her political aspirations to secure a legacy in the next court of Akbar? But such speculations do not hold true because if she had such political ambitions, uh, we find that with her deep sophistic inclinations, it does not seem probable. Since there was a gap of 19 years between Zebu Nisa and her wavered brother, if we can use the term, she was only being protective towards him. But the act became unpardonable in the mind of Aurangzeb. So some of the poignant expressions were written in the grim solitude of Salimgarh fort, where she remained confined for a very long period from 1681 to 1702, unforgiven till her death as Aurangzeb outlived her. Some of her couplets arduously studied by Professor Askari from Mufidul Insha, a work by Champat Rai and a valuable work which he purchased and contributed it to the esteemed library of Khudabaksh Oriental uh, Khudabaksh. So I say that I quote this, I cite this couplet. I become concealed like the sweet smell in the leaves of a rose flower. Whoever has any desire to see me may find me out in my poetical effusions. The second couplet that I would cite is, I'm the daughter of a king, but I have, have taken to the ways of poverty like dervishes. My beauty and decoration of a woman. The Sufi inclination, which is so evident in her in Mufidul Insha, which was consulted by Professor Askari and on her sources on writing about Zivinisa, he went to Alamgir Nama, to Masirul Omra, to Divan of Maganlal and many others. In fact, one of the works of Jadunath Sarkar, which he had written on Zebunisa. Here, I would add two other aspects which is reflected in the poetic effusions. Like Jahaara, Zebunisa too was maligned, as I've mentioned earlier, accused of immorality and impurity of character, and aspersion was cast on her name with Akil Khan, the governor of Delhi, also a poet who wrote with the pen name Razi. It is Professor Askari who has gone deeply into it to clarify the confusion that remains there. And I would also add that the trend to link these unmarried Shehzadis was found more in the writings of Manucci and Francois Bernier as the luminescent dynasty was having its hold, its sway, its aura. These slandering remarks were being made on the women of these dynasties. Aspersions were cast on their character, but it does not take away the sophistic leanings they possessed and valued. Let me cite the two mournful elegy of Jahara and Zebunisa. Bark Dehelbi says there is neither a candle nor a sheet nor a flower cover for the grave. Just a heap of mud survives to narrate the grim tale of admonition. And this brings about the poignancy of a grim solitude which she bore for the 20 last years of her life who had once been 
given the title of Padshah Begum, and later the title was given to her younger sister, Zina Tunnisa. Jahara too is buried in a tomb of her own design and choosing most unostentatious, but it still has its aura as I had an opportunity to visit her uh, place of burial. And it is also the most sacred one for it ensures immortal life, a simple open air tomb of white marble, a cryptic answer to the enigma. Let nothing cover my tomb, save the green grass. Grass suffices well as a covering for the grave of the lowly who left the royal aura and turned towards Sufism so that the Timurid dynasty could have its enduring legacy left behind. These Shehzadis, the particularly Jahara and Zebunisa, they made unprecedented claims to the Timurid Mughal legacy by giving birth to the divine effulgence of the reigning sovereign as a function of a piety. In defiance to the imperial advances, their imperial vision sought alternative means to light the Timurid legacy and grafted their own representation into perpetuity. And this is where the feminine tradition of the Timurids can be located and identified. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Abhi ham logo ne, ham logo ne, Rita Sharma ma'am se, ma'am se, I'm the feminine, the feminine civilization, civilization ke baare. Bahut bahut thanya baat, thanya baat. Bahut shukriya apka. Abhi I, Abhi I, Suman Kumar ji, director, state directorate of archives, and our host. For this function to kindly say a few words. I must add that it is due to his keen interest and persistent efforts that this lecture could be organized. So I'll be thankful if Suman Sahib says a few words to us. Suman Sahib, please. Thank you, sir. Bahut bahut इस अवसर पर हम लोग अस्करी साहब का के कार्यों को याद कर रहे हैं इस अवसर पर मैं उपस्थित के लोग हैं मैं उनका स्वागत करता हूं और हम लोग सभी जानते हैं कि अस्करी साहब कितने बड़े विद्वान थे इतिहास के कितने मर्मज्ञ थे इन द वर्ड्स ऑफ Imtiaz Ahmad, Professor Imtiaz Ahmad, not many persons become a legend in their lifetime, but Sayyid Hassan Askari was one of them. His contribution to the study of the history of medieval Bihar is unmatched and unforgettable. His writings on Bihar spread over a period of more than four decades in English and Urdu over a broad range, historiography to cultural history are invaluable source of Packets in invaluable source of wisdom for us. May Sapsar Pat Mapnis Karikram Ki Adak Stakar Re, Professor Intiaz Ahmad Sahab, Johamari Sapki Guru Hai, or Love the Protestant Ithias Kar Hai, Unse Better Kun Hosak Tai, Jo Professor Askari Sahab Kis work ko Ki Adak Stakar Sake. और इस अवसर पर हमें सैयद अहमद रजा साहब की उपस्थिति प्राप्त हुई वी आर वी हैव ऑल प्रेज फॉर हिम जो सभ्यता अपने इतिहास को भुला देती है और सभ्यता विनष्ट हो जाती है मुझे इस बात की बहुत खुशी है कि अहमद साहब ने में इतना पैशन है अपने नाना जी के प्रति और उस स्कॉलर के प्रति जिसने इस देश को और इस मानवता को बहुत कुछ दिया है मैं अपनी ओर से और विभाग की ओर से अहमद साहब को बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद ज्ञापित करता हूं उनका स्वागत करता हूं और उन्हें धन्यवाद ज्ञापित करता हूं मैडम सुनीता शर्मा साहब शर्मा साहिबा आपकी विद्वता से हम लोग 
पहली बार मैडम को सुनने का अवसर मिला और आपकी विद्वता से हम लोग बहुत बहुत प्रभावित बहुत जानकारी मिली हम कुछ दिन पहले प्रोफेसर इम्तियाज अहमद साहब से मेरी भेंट हुई थी तो मैंने उनसे पूछा था कि वो जो मुगल हिस्ट्री में जो जो लेखिका मतलब इतिहासकार उसको महिला नहीं महिला नहीं वो इतिहासकार है उनके बारे में मैंने जानकारी चाहिए थी तो उन्होंने मैडम का नाम सुझाया था कि मैडम ने गुलबदन बेगम पर काफी कुछ काम किया है और वो रचना जो है बाबर नामा शायद उनके पास अवेलेबल हो तो मैडम को सुनने का बहुत सौभाग्य प्राप्त हुआ मैडम आपका बहुत बहुत स्वागत और धन्यवाद कि आप इस अवसर पे आई और हम सबों को ज्ञान में वृद्धि की और पूरी जो लोग इस वेब के माध्यम से सुन रहे होंगे इस अक्सरी साहब के मेमोरियल लेक्चर को वो सभी लाभान्वित होंगे हम उम्मीद करते हैं कि आपका सहयोग और आपकी उपस्थिति हमको इस मतलब इस अभिलेखागार में जरूर मिलती रहेगी मैं अपनी ओर से और विभाग की ओर से आपको बहुत बहुत आपका धन्यवाद ज्ञापित करता हूं और मैं इसके अलावे अब मैं समझता हूं कि मैं माइक जो है वो प्रोफेसर इम्तियाज अहमद साहब को सुपुर्द करता हूँ बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सर आप धन्यवाद सर अभी हम लोगों ने बिहार राज्य अभिलेखागार निदेशालय के निदेशक श्री सुमन कुमार सर सर से दो शब्द सुना बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया सर कार्यक्रम को आगे बढ़ाते हुए हम लोग आज के कार्यक्रम के अध्यक्ष डॉक्टर इम्तियाज अहमद सर पूर्व निदेशक खुदा बख्स और पब्लिक लाइब्रेरी पटना से आग्रह करूंगा कि सर अपने अध्यक्षीय भाषण से हमारे सुध ही श्रोताजन को रूबरू कराए सर Uh, before we wind up this session, I have just a few things to share with you. Uh, first of all, I must say that I have been greatly uh, benefited by the very valuable presentation of Dr. Sunita Sharma. We all know that she has been doing some very good work on feminine history, if I can use that word. both in the context of medieval and modern india and i gain much from her presentation here i am also glad that ahmed took some time to share the recent updates on the historiography project well i have the privilege of knowing many things from him beforehand but today it was good to hear this from him in this official official uh, capacity i would say the official presentation that he made for this historiography project uh, just one minor point that i would like to add to what you said amal is that the translation of the urdu article in the abstracts they were essentially nidha's work i was there for any support that she needed but that was essentially her work and uh, and i'm not trying to uh, take any credit for this but that lost manuscript of sirat e firoz shahi was discovered by me the type copy was lying with anki prakashan i took it from them uh, i got the whole thing processed during my tenure but i did not have the good fortune to see that work appear in print but anyway i am happy that i could at least locate it and that has ultimately led to the publication of that work uh, i think it is an honor for me that in some way or other i was associated with this very important in fact unique contribution of professor askari to medieval indian historiography his last but to me his finest writing the editing work that he did uh professor sharma spoke at length about the feminine tradition among the timurids comparing it with the ottomans the safavids and also the mongols and she focused mainly on the political aspect and the let's say religious or mystic aspect of the activities of these eminent ladies she also referred to the role of hamida banu as a historian and of uh, dildar agacha as an ambassador these were very useful pieces of information for me but uh, i i feel that something could also have been added 
about the charitable and cultural activities, especially of ladies like Noor Jahan and Jahanara, about whom Dr. Sharma has already written elsewhere. And I believe it was the constraint of time because of which she could not bring in those things. And finally, while we talk about the role of the women among the Timurids, we must also keep in mind the role played by some of the very important ladies in pre-Mughal India. For example, Razia Sultan, or when it comes to intervening over question of succession, we have Shah Turkan, the very powerful and ambitious wife of Il Turmish, who in a way was responsible for sidelining Razia for some time. Another aspect which to me appears to be very interesting about the Timurids in India is the manner in which Akbar entered into matrimonial relations with the Rajputs and this was a totally new uh, group, I would say, or a totally new community that was integrated into the Mughal harem tradition and they also made their valuable contribution. For example, if we look at the differences between Jahangir and Khosrow and the role that Khosrow's mother, a Rajput lady, played in trying to resolve those differences, that shows, and to me this is very unique about the Timurids in India, that they intermingle with in other cases we have intermingling with different sects within the same community, but here they intermingle with another community and grant the same status or the same respect for the new entrance into the Mughal era. And one final thing is that I, I, I may be sounding a discordant note, but uh, you see all the comparison between women and divinity and the respectability, sanctity attached to them, in one way or the other, devolves down to this, that they enjoyed that status very essentially at the theoretical level, and that too, because they happened to be the mothers of the sovereign. It is not that they enjoyed that status in their own right, I would say, and I'm sorry if I'm striking a discordant note, but uh, they enjoyed this status primarily because of their being the mothers, the walida of the sovereign or the shansha. So those things also I believe are of interest and I look forward to another article by Professor Sharma in which she will be highlighting these notes. So thank you very much. And I am also thankful to Dr. Suman Sahib for his presence and for his very warm hospitality. And thank you the other colleagues of State Archives. And may I now request Dr. Ashok Ranjan to continue further with the formalities. Dhanyavad, sir. Abhi hum logo ne sir ke adhyakshiya bhaasan se guru baru hua. Karikaram shane shane shamaapti ki or bad raha hai aur manch dhanyavad gyaapan ke liye hum Dr. Bharti Sarma ma'am se agrah karenge ki ma'am aap abhasi manch par upasthit hain kindly mic on kar le aur hamare sabhi manchasin vidwat jan ka dhanyawad gyapan kare ma'am dhanyawad ashok ji jaisa ki ashok ji ne kaha ki karyakram apni purnata ki aur agresar hai aur matra dhanyawad ke ek antim kadi shesh hai aur uske pehle main professor sayed haskari hasan askari sir ko shraddhanjali deti hu jinhone apne shodh purn lekhan se itihas jagat ko labhanvit kiya hai वह एक खोजी प्रवृत्ति के शोधकर्ता थे कुछ नया खोजने की धुन उनमें हमेशा रहती थी इसलिए शोधार्थियों के लिए वे चलते फिरते इंसाइक्लोपीडिया थे किस गली कुएं मंदिर मस्जिद का नाम कैसे पड़ा और इसका उल्लेख किस किताब में है इसकी प्रामाणिक जानकारी वे सहज ही देते थे ऐसा हम लोग हमेशा सुनते हैं जो भी मेडेवल पीरियड के प्रोफेसर है उन लोगों के द्वारा अस्करी साहब अभिलेखों के संरक्षण हेतु की हम लोग आज अर्काइव्स में उनको श्रद्धांजलि अर्पित कर रहे हैं वो अर्काइव से भी जुड़े हुए थे और अभिलेखों के संरक्षण हेतु बने इंडियन हिस्टोरिकल रिकॉर्ड्स कमीशन के सदस्य भी थे बिहार में जो उन्नीस सौ पैंतालीस में रीजनल रिकॉर्ड सर्वे कमेटी का गठन हुआ था उसके भी सदस्य थे और अभिलेखों के संकलन और संरक्षण हेतु उनका योगदान महत्वपूर्ण है मैं अस्करी साहब के ग्रांड सन सैयद अहमद रजा सर को धन्यवाद देना चाहूंगी जो अपना बेशकीमती समय निकालकर हमारे कार्यक्रम में चार चांद लगा देते एवं हम बेसब्री से उन्हें सुनना चाहते हैं कि अस्करी सर से जुड़ी किसी नई बात से हम रूबरू होंगे 
और ऐसा हमेशा होता भी है आज उन्होंने स्लाइड के माध्यम से उनकी पूरी जीवनी व उपलब्धियां बताई तथा कई रेयर फोटोज भी दिखाए जो कि हम लोगों ने पहले नहीं देखे थे दो तीन ही फोटो हम लोग उनका देखते थे आज उनके कृपा से हम लोगों ने काफी फोटोज देखे उनके डिफरेंट फेजेस के उसके लिए उनका हृदय से धन्यवाद हमारी आज की मुख्य वक्ता डॉक्टर सुनीता शर्मा मैडम को धन्यवाद देती हूँ जिन्होंने बहुत ही रोचक विषय पर व्याख्यान प्रस्तुत किया तेमरुट सिविलाइजेशन के बारे में हम लोग उस समय के शासक जो जेंट्स शासक है पुरुष वर्ग है उनके बारे में जानते हैं महिलाओं के बारे में बहुत ज्यादा हम लोग नहीं जानते हैं लेकिन मैडम ने उनके बारे में काफी कुछ बताया कि उस समय के शासन के में आध्यात्मिकता के बारे में लेखन के बारे में स्थापत्य के बारे में विभिन्न क्षेत्रों में उन लोगों ने अपना नाम रोशन किया तथा कई उपाधियां भी प्राप्त की उन सब की जानकारी मैडम ने बहुत विस्तार से दी खानजादा बेगम हमीदा बानो बेगम गुलबदन बेगम सलीमा सुल्तान बेगम नूर जहां जहां आरा जेबुनुसा बेगम के बारे में मैडम ने काफी कुछ बताया गुलबेदन बेगम ने हुमायूं नामा की रचना की थी जो उस समय के सामाजिक और आर्थिक इतिहास की जानकारी प्रदान करती है मतलब उस काल में भी महिला इतिहासकार जिनको आज भी हम पढ़ते हैं और उस समय की जानकारी प्राप्त करते हैं इसके लिए मैडम का बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सलीमा सुल्तान बेगम के बारे में मैडम नाम नाम से शायद वो लिखती थी और उनकी काफी रिच लाइब्रेरी थी जो एक किताब के बारे में मैडम ने एक चर्चा की जेबुनिसा बेगम ने भी लेखन के क्षेत्र में काफी काम किया धन्यवाद मैडम इतनी अच्छी महत्वपूर्ण जानकारी देने के लिए आपको काफी धन्यवाद आज के कार्यक्रम के अध्यक्ष डॉक्टर इम्तियाज अहमद सर को हृदय से धन्यवाद देती हूँ जिन्होंने सारगर्भित अध्यक्षीय भाषण दिया सर हम हम सभी मूल्य सुझाव देते रहते हैं और हम सभी उनके सुझावों से लाभान्वित होते रहते हैं धन्यवाद सर हमारे निदेशक महोदय जिनके संरक्षण और मार्गदर्शन में यह कार्यक्रम हुआ उनका भी हृदय से धन्यवाद करती हूँ हमारे सहायक निदेशक एवं अभिलेखागार के सभी सदस्य जिन्होंने किसी न किसी रूप से इस कार्यक्रम को सफल बनाने में अपना सहयोग दिया है उन सभी को धन्यवाद हमारे तकनीकी विशेषज्ञ श्री पंकज कुमार जिनकी तकनीकी दक्षता के कारण यह कार्यक्रम सफल हुआ उन्हें भी धन्यवाद देती हूँ साथ ही सभी श्रोतागण जो इस वेबिनार से जुड़े हुए हैं जिनकी सहभागिता से यह कार्यक्रम सफल होता है उन सभी को धन्यवाद धन्यवाद आप सभी को कोटिश धन्यवाद बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद मैम अभी हम लोगों ने डॉक्टर भारती शर्मा से धन्यवाद ज्ञापन सुना कार्यक्रम पूर्णतः समाप्ति की ओर बढ़ चुका है और बिहार राज्य अभिलेखागार निदेशालय के निदेशक महोदय श्री सुमन सर के कुशल निर्देशन में एवं डॉक्टर इम्तियाज अहमद सर की अध्यक्षता में आज ये कार्यक्रम संपन्न हुआ आप सभी श्रोताजन जो आभासी मंच से जुड़े हैं एवं हमारे सभी सम्मानित मंचाशीन मुख्य वक्ता सैयद अमर राजा साहब सुनीता शर्मा मैम एवं हमारे सभी सहयोग कर्मी मैं आप सभी का पुनः धन्यवाद ज्ञापन करता हूँ कार्यक्रम समाप्ति की औपचारिक घोषणा की जाती है